<laughs> Very calm. Okay. Good. Thank you, darling. Thank you, Kathy. And good morning, everybody. It is so good to be here. Listen, Christ is risen. And it was about a year and a half ago that we started the book of Ezra. Can you believe it? It takes us a long time because we went through the first six chapters of Ezra. We studied chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Ezekiel. We studied Haggai. We've studied Zechariah. All of that is related to the first return of the Jews from Babylon, from exile. I heard Pastor McNabb today is teaching on the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the one who led the third return. We are on the second return led by the man Ezra. And I'm so glad we're there because it's taken me a long time to get there, but it's been a great study. And I have always been excited when I study the man Ezra because he was a man after my heart, or I'm a woman after his heart. He loved the Word of God. He loved to teach it. And so we're going to study about him today. We have looked at the book of Ezra, chapters 1 through 6, and you will not find the man Ezra, the man Ezra, mentioned in chapters 1 through 6. We don't meet him until chapter 7. So the context of chapters 7 through 10, 7, 8, 9, and 10, the context is when Ezra brings back a second group of exiles back to Judah. It's the post-exilic period, as you know. So, when we studied Daniel's prayer a few weeks ago, we, set, we studied his three petitions of God. Do you remember what he asked God for in that prayer? What's the first one? Well, the first one is the temple, God's residence. He asked God to bless the work of his temple. His temple at the point, point in time in Jerusalem was completely and totally destroyed. And so Daniel is praying now because Cyrus has come to re that the temple will be rebuilt. So the first thing he prays for, and this is number one on your paper, Daniel's petitions, he said to remember God the temple. See the temple and hear our prayer. The second thing he prayed for was the people who were exiles in Babylon. And remember, the people who were taken to Babylon uh, the, the Jerusalem and all of Judah had defied the law of God. They were not following the, the law of God. They were abusing and killing and stoning the prophets. And God had Babylon destroy Jerusalem. And so we're praying now. Daniel is praying for the people of Judah. What's the third thing he's praying for in that? For Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. It had been uh, uh, destroyed as well. God's holy city. So we're going to see that he re said to God to remember the temple. Remember and see the spiritual condition of the people. Let's think about them in, Jer in Babylon. The priests could not perform their functions as a priest because the temple was not there. God said the only place that they could sacrifice animals for these sacrifices and these offerings was in the temple at the place God chose. And God chose Jerusalem. So the priests could not function. So the word of God was not their focus. They were living in a pagan environment, a pagan nation. And, and so God... Daniel recognizes that and he says, please remember the spiritual condition of their people and the city of Jerusalem. Now on number two, we're going to see that the exiles return home and they face three major challenges. And we saw all three of these challenges in chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra. The first challenge that they faced in the post-exilic period, all right? is the rebuilding of the temple. And we saw all that in chapters 1 through 4, didn't we? And 5 and 6, how all of the, all of the challenges they went through and the 
their enemies, oppressing them and keeping them from building the temple. That was the one of the major well, that was the challenge, wasn't it, in chapters 1 through 6. And then we see when, when they came, and we're going to see in chapters 7 and 8, when Ezra came back to Jerusalem, he saw again the spiritual condition of the people. Because when they got to Jerusalem, most of the people there were pagan worshipers because they'd been brought in from other nations, hadn't they? And they didn't have a temple. And so they were assimilating into the pagan culture in Persia and even in Jerusalem. The culture was pagan and the committing of idolatry. And one of the major commands that God gave his people, and I want you to put this into your mind, when they moved into the promised land, when God gave them this, his rules, for, he said, when you move in here, do not marry the people of these nations. Do not. Why? Because they will become a thorn in your eye, a thorn in your flesh. In fact, what they will do is they will lead your children into worshiping other gods. Don't intermarry. And so when you read chapter 8, of, uh, maybe it was chapter 9 of Ezra. So start reading 7, 8, 9, and 10. And when you read that chapter, guess what Ezra found when he came into Jerusalem? That the people had intermarried. And it, it broke his heart. And furthermore, it terrified him. Because God said, don't do it. And that's why they were in exile in the first place. So th they were assimilating into a pagan culture. So that was the second challenge. Rebuilding the temple and then the, the threat and the actual reality of it. Of God's people assimilating into a pagan culture. And finally, the third the third. Op uh, the third challenge was rebuilding Jerusalem. King Artaxerxes said, you will not rebuild Jerusalem until I give you further notice. That's, that's Ezra uh, 4. Remember that? And then they came in and destroyed it again. Everything that the Jews had done in those 80 years to rebuild Jerusalem, the Persians and the Samaritans destroyed it. So it was a really, really challenging time. So the three things that Daniel prayed for were the very challenges that the people faced as they came home. And then God in his sovereign plan, and I love studying this because we see God's overall sovereignty and his, uh, and his, his pre-planning of what's going to happen. So he, he called pagan kings to help him accomplish his sovereign will. And he called Jewish leaders as well. God still does that today. And he calls you and me to be a part of his sovereign plan in getting it accomplished. So who were the kings and who were the leaders that were answering Daniel's prayer? You know what? Daniel prayed these, this prayer in about two years after Cyrus destroyed or conquered Babylon. He was an old, old man. He's probably close to 90. And he was praying this in Babylon. And we know that he died soon after that. And so he never saw the answer to his prayers. Never saw the answers. What's that say to you and me? I mean, here was the most godly of men in the Bible praying these prayers, and he never saw the answers. What does that tell you and me? What? Brenda? Brenda? In God's time, not our time. God's timing, not our time. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard to accept. What, Kathy? We may never see the answers to our prayers. That's right. We will not see many answers to our prayers until we get to heaven someday. And when Jesus comes back as King of Kings is when we will see the answer to our prayers. Let's see what happened here. Well, who was involved? Which kings were involved in accomplishing God's will in rebuilding and dedicating the temple? Cyrus. 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 And who was the other one? Darius. That's right. Darius. And I heard, did you say that too, Naomi? Yes. Good, Darius. So King Cyrus and Darius the first. 
And then who was the Jewish leader? Who was, who was the one that was most uh, official in rebuilding the temple? Artaxerxes. That's a king. Who was the Jewish leader? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. That's right, Governor Zerubbabel. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he is the one who put the, the cornerstone in the temple. The cornerstone is the first temple stone in the foundation. Yes, yes. If you don't know the answer, just say Zerubbabel. If you never know the answer in the Bible, just say Zerubbabel. But that's pretty much the answer? You know, we, is that what you mean? Yeah, I was trying to be funny. <laughs> Okay, that is funny because, because you know, Zerubbabel, like Ezra, are two men that we really neglect in our studies of the Old Testament, aren't they? Yeah. And they're heroes. They are real heroes. And we're going to learn more about that. But um, Zerubbabel laid the cornerstone in the foundation, and that stone was the first stone. And every stone after that was aligned to the cornerstone, like Jesus. The scriptures say he is the cornerstone of our faith. And we align everything we believe to what Jesus said. Furthermore, Zerubbabel laid the capstone. What's that? The, the last stone, the one where you lay it, put it in, and you celebrate because it is the last stone. Just like Jesus, he is the capstone. He is the ultimate fruition of our, of our beliefs. Isn't that exciting? Also, yes. the capstone makes everything stand. I mean, it fits the... It holds it together, doesn't it? That capstone fits so securely in there that it holds the whole, found the whole structure together. Jesus is the capstone. He holds it all together. That's a wonderful, wonderful study for you to take some time and teach. All right. So it was a rule. Now, who who was the king? Who was now? We haven't studied this, so I'm going to tell you, the king who was responsible for the spiritual growth of the people coming home from Persia was King Artaxerxes. Now remember, he's the one in Ezra 4 who said, you cannot build Jerusalem. Don't even think about it until I tell you. But yet we find, and we're going to read this in chapter 7 of Ezra, that Artaxerxes wrote a letter to Ezra. And he said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and I want you to make sure that the people, everybody from the Euphrates River to the, to the Mediterranean Sea, that's called Trans-Euphrates. He said, make sure that they are obeying the law. Make sure that they know the law. And if they don't know the law, teach it to them. Is that amazing? And that's what Artaxerxes said. And you know why he said that? Not because he thought our God, the God of Israel, was his God. He just knew he was another God, a most powerful God. And he said, why should we risk who our nation to the wrath of the God of Israel? He, he understood that God and his expectations. And he said, Ezra, you go back and you teach it. If they don't know it, you teach it to them and you make sure they obey it. That's how... And so Ezra comes back and finds that the people, even in Israel, are not following the law of God. We'll read on that. So it was King Artaxerxes that God used to make sure that his people knew his word. Isn't that cool? And so the man who was in sp the Jewish leader was Ezra. He came back and he looked at the people and he began to teach them the word. And in Nehemiah, we read where he stood on a huge platform like this one. And he stood up there and he read the word of God to the people. And then he explained it to them. And you know what the people did? They rejoiced. I love that. So that's Daniel's answer to the spiritual plight of the people came through King Artaxerxes and the Jewish leader Ezra. Now which king was responsible for rebuilding Jerusalem? You don't know yet, so I'm going to tell you. Okay, The same Artaxerxes who said do not rebuild Jerusalem 20 years later sent Nehemiah back to Jerusalem with a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And that's in Nehemiah chapter 2. And we'll get there. Is that where Pastor taught this morning? 
What chapter did, Nehem, did Pastor teach from Nehemiah today? Or just kind of all of it? Okay, probably the one he said, stand on the wall, stay on the wall. Okay, anyway, it was King Artaxerxes, the very man whose people destroyed Jerusalem again, is also the one who issued a decree to rebuild it. And whom did he send back to, to oversee that? Nehemiah. Nehemiah. So look at this. King Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, pagan kings, were the ones whom God used to implement his plan, his sovereign plan for his people. And then he used Zerubbabel, who took the first group of people back. He used Ezra, who took the second group of people back. And then he used Nehemiah, who took the third group of people back to accomplish God's plan and to answer Daniel's prayer. You know what? Uh, I don't think I've ever heard that lesson because nobody really ever studies Artaxerxes in the Bible, do we? And as I was thinking about this, you know, sometimes God just opens your mind to thoughts. And I thought, when I studied Daniel's prayer, then it all came together here, just like this. I thought, that is so wonderful how God, I mean, he just kind of revealed it to me. It was exciting to just have that come into my mind. And, you know, it was a real, real still, small voice, and it just came into my mind like that, and it just came all together. That's cool. So. It's going to happen with all of you as you study God's Word. Right, Jessica? We're glad you're here today, sweetheart. Okay, so that is p page 123, Roman numeral 1A. Anybody need help with that? Everybody got it filled out? Yes? yes. Okay, good. Okay. What? One of the, uh, Pastor McNabb's favorite scriptures in my is when he said the people had a mind to work. Oh yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. The people had a mind to work. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. That's one of his favorite scriptures. So then Ezra tells us in the book of Ezra about the first return. This is letter B, and you probably want to fill this out. Number one, Ezra 1 through 4 is the first return. That was in 538 B.C. And who allowed them to go home? I already told you. What was his name? Cyrus, Cyrus and, and King Cyrus the Great. And how many Jews returned home with him? Do you remember? That's in Ezra 2, by the way. The whole list of, of people, family leaders who brought their families home. 40,000 of them. Pretty much a lot of people, wasn't it? 40,000 people, Ezra 2, returned with Zerubbabel. And who was their leader, Timothy? Who was their leader, the first return? <laughs> That's right, Governor Zerubbabel. That's letter B. And then, now we're going to look at Ezra 5 and 6. That's when the temple was completed. Who was the leader in completing the temple? Timothy? Zerubbabel. Thank you. <laughs> And it was completed exactly 70 years after it was destroyed. That's one of my favorite things that I learned too. God said that they would be in exile 70 years. Well, uh, they almost were, but this is even closer to, this is 70 years exactly. When they were exiled from their temple. And now it's been rebuilt. It had been 70 years. Zerubbabel laid the cornerstone and the capstone. There's my picture of it. I knew I had it somewhere. The cornerstone is that foundation stone at the very bottom right here. Right there is the cornerstone. And here is the capstone, the very last stone. I always thought the capstone was this stone in the arch, but they call that the keystone. And this is the capstone. And Zerubbabel laid those. The temple was dedicated to the Lord. And for the first time in 70 years, they were able to offer sacrifices to God in the temple. And it, this inaugurated what? The second temple period. Now, I have taught you this so many times, you probably have it memorized, don't you? Yep. But it's really important to review. I hope you didn't get tired of that. So look at letter B. Anybody need help on that one? Letter B, Ezra 1 through 4 and 5 and 6. 
Okie dokie, I knew you wouldn't. Do you need some help? I you don't. Tanja, you need some help? Selfish. Just look at hers. Just look at Amy's. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. What? Cheap. No, we, we, can, we can look at our neighbor's papers in here. All right, now, between Ezra, so we're finished with Ezra 6. Now, where do we go when we read the Bible chronologically? Good. Who said that? Thank you, Karen. Esther. We read the book of Esther, and we meet her husband, and what was her husband's name? Xerxes. Xerxes. King Xerxes I. And then in Ezra 4, we read that parenthetical passage. Remember, say you do remember. And that's when Ezra decides to tell us that there were similar instances, not only of all of the obstructions of their Samaritan opponents in rebuilding the temple, but they also resisted them in rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. And that's when Artaxerxes is introduced when he wrote the letter to them and said, do not rebuild Jerusalem because it has been a wicked city. And I want your taxes. I don't want your taxes staying there. So it was a very interesting letter. I hope you read that. So it introduces us to Artaxerxes. He was probably the son of Xerxes and the stepson of Esther. Now let's go ahead and read uh, chapter... Uh, okay, now we're on chapter 7, verse 1. Okay? So why don't you turn in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 7, verse 1. This is after... Xerxes and Esther, and now we're meeting her stepson. After these things, okay, this isn't a verse, is it? Let me just read this. In the, okay, in the first year of his reign, Artaxerxes, okay, I just got ahead of myself, so stay with me, all right? Uh, in this chapter right here, Ezra 4, Artaxerxes decreed that the Jews couldn't rebuild their city. Until he told them. And how long did it was it before he told them to rebuild it? 20 years. That's right. And during that time, the Samaritans and the Persians destroyed all that the Jews had accomplished in rebuilding their city. And so that's letters C and D. Got that filled out? <clears throat> what, Brenda? Letter C, between Ezra 6 and 7, we read the book of Esther. Okay, but under D, right above that, I missed that. And D? The second D, temple period. Oh, you're talking about number 2, letter D? Yeah, yeah the second temple period. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Now then, letter D, do we need help on that, capital D? No? Y'all are quick. King, on the number one, I'm sorry. Okay, number one, in 465 B.C., who decreed that the Jews could not rebuild their... Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes could not rebuild their city. That's right here. Could Artaxerxes could not rebuild their city. Number two, the Samaritans and the Persians then did what? Destroyed. Mm -hmm. Destroyed all the rebuilding that had been, because it's close to 80 years now. They've been back with, from, with King Cyrus. So they, they just didn't sit around. They were rebuilding their city. And the Samaritans saw it and said, no, you can't do that. And they destroyed it. All right. Now that's where we are when we get to chapter 7. Okay. Chapter 7. This is let Roman numeral 2 on your page. For the first time in chapter 7, we meet the author of the book. Who is that? Ezra. Ezra. And it's the post-exilic history book um, of Ezra. And here is verses 7 and 8. And we'll introduce to you in a moment Ezra. But I want to read verses 7 and 8 first. This is the second return of the Jews back to Jerusalem, and it was authorized by King Artaxerxes. Let's read verses 7 and 8. Some of the Israelites, including priests, 
Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants. These are the people who served in the temple. All came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So now we know exactly when they came. Lyndon's everything okay there? Are you confused? Okay. Ezra, verse 8. Now let's see. They came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. And we're going to find later that it took him four months to get back to Jerusalem. So we see Artaxerxes' commission was in what year? Seventh His seventh year, he commissioned Ezra to lead these group of people well, back. Change his mind? People God. I know that. Well, he knew Ezra because we're going to read what he said about Ezra. He knew Ezra very well. Just like he knew Nehemiah as his cupbearer, he knew ne Ezra as a great civil servant and, and as well as a religious leader of his people. So uh, I think he recognized his potential in going back to Judah and teaching the law of God. So let's look at this letter A. If, if they came back in 538 B.C., and it's the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, 457, that's 81 years. They've been back to Jerusalem for 81 years. Who would have thought? You know, when you don't really study secular history and find out about these kings, you just read over this. But it's been 81 years since the people first came back with Zerubbabel. How many of you knew that? None of us knew that because we don't know when the Artaxerxes served, right? But now we do. Okay, so it's been 81 years. How many years since they completed the temple? In 516 B.C.? You subtract 516 minus 457 and you get 69 years. It's been 69 years since Ezra 6. Listen up. 69 years since Ezra 6 when they dedicated the new temple and then Xerxes and Esther had their book and now we're at Ezra 7. 69 years between Ezra 6 and 7. Cool. Any questions on that? So how many years since the completion of the second temple? 69 years. Alrighty. Questions? Why did I put that in there? Who cares about dates? Remember when you were in high school? Do we have to remember all these dates? Yeah. Remember that? Why, am I, why do I keep hitting on these dates? Because when you read this book of Ezra and you read the book of Nehemiah, you think it happened one day, one day, one day. And it's more than a hundred years between uh, when they first came back under Cyrus and they do their third um, return and rebuild Jerusalem. More than a hundred years. It's really, really interesting, I think. All right. So what do we know about Ezra? Okay, here we go. If we, we will find in verses 1 through 5, this is Ezra 7, letter B. Number 1, we know he was a priest. So how do we know that? Well, here, let's gonna, we're going to read that in verses 1. Now hang in here because I'm going to read a lot of names because Jews love their genealogy because... You couldn't be a priest and serve in the temple unless you could show you were a dis direct descendant of whom? Judah. Of Levi. Of Aaron. Aaron. Aaron of the tribe of Levi. <laughs> okay. Judah. That's right. Judah's, I mean, no, Jacob's son, <coughs> Levi, had a son named Aaron and Moses. Okay. You had to be show that you were a dis direct descendant of Aaron. So, uh, during these th after these things, this is verses 1 through 5, so after the book of Esther, okay? During the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, here we go, son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah. Now, Hilkiah... Uh, Hilkiah, Hilkiah, Hilkiah. Um, 
Hilkiah was that descendant of his who who was the high priest during King Hezekiah's time and the temple had been neglected and allowed to just fall into disrepair. He went in and cleaned the temple and guess what he found? When he cleaned the temple, the word of God, the law. So he is a direct descendant of Hilkiah and you can, or uh, where, Hilkiah right here. You'll read about him in 2 Chronicles 34. So, Hilkiah, who was the son of Shalom, who was the son of Zadok, who was the son of Ahitab, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Marioth, and it just keeps going. Can you do that with your genealogy? Can you go all the way back? Uh, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzai, the son of Buckai, the son of Abishwa, the son of Phineas. Hey, I know him. He was one of the sons, I think, of, uh, of Aaron. The son of Eleazar. So Eleazar was the son of Aaron. This is Aaron's grandson, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. He could go all the way back to Aaron, the chief priest, 500 years earlier, by the way. We can go back 100 years, maybe, Lyndon. <laughs> so here we find that he was a priest, and he had to be, because he had to be the son of Aaron, descendant of Aaron. He was a descendant of Hilkiah. He was the one who found the, the law in the temple that he was cleaning up. He was from the priestly line of whom? Aaron, that's right. And when he was in, Jer in Babylon, he could not serve as a high priest. He couldn't serve as a priest because he was, they didn't have a temple in Babylon. So let's look at letter B, number one. What do we know about Ezra? Number one, he was a what? Priest. He was a descendant of whom? Well, Hilkiah, the high priest who found the lost copy of the law. Wouldn't that be terrible to be living without a Bible? Wouldn't that be awful? And they'd not to know the word of God. Wouldn't that just, wouldn't we have a, I mean, how would you know what's right and wrong? You wouldn't, would you? Because the Bible is God's standard for us. And the scriptures say, woe to those people who call good for evil and evil for good. Because you've taken the standard of God and you've said it's not true. And that's what they had in that time when they lost their Bible. Uh, number B, Ezra was from the priestly line of Aaron. Aaron. And he was unable to serve as priest because there was no... Temple. Temple. Now there was in Jerusalem, but for him to serve as priest, he had to be in Jerusalem to serve in the temple. Is everybody keeping up with me? Yep. All right. Now we also know from the scriptures and from the Bible in Ezra, Ezra writes this about himself, he was a scribe. Now a scribe is one in that day and time who copied the scriptures and they had to be very, very, very fluent in, in their writing, in their script, and in their reading and understanding of Hebrew. And he did. And he must have studied that right there in Babylon because he had to have been born in Babylon because it had been 80-some years since, it'd been since Jerusalem had been destroyed. So he was born in Babylon, but here we find this man in Babylon, a scribe of the word of God. Let's read what it says in verse 6. This Ezra, this one who was a descendant of all these people in those first five verses, this Ezra came up from Babylon. Now you've seen a map of Babylon. It says up. Well, really Babylon is straight east. Why does it keep saying up from Babylon. They had to follow the Euphrates River going from Babylon, go follow the river, and then go down to Israel, to Judah, which was right next to the Mediterranean coast. And I'll show you a map of that in a minute. He came up from Babylon. Now look what it says about this man. I love this. He was a teacher well-versed 
in the law of Moses. I love that. I mean, he studied the scriptures and he was a teacher, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. So first of all, being a scribe, we know that he was a teacher. Look what he had done. He devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord. Furthermore, he devoted himself to teaching its decrees and laws. What a great man. He loved the word of God. And I'm going to show you a psalm that tradition says that he wrote. And it's all about the word of God. This is a copy of the letter King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra, the priest. He was a, a, Artaxerxes recognized him as a teacher of the law. Artaxerxes recognized him as a man learned in matters concerning the commandments and decrees of the Lord for Israel. Class, I would like to say and to think that when people talk about us, we're going to, they can say that they were a student of the scriptures and they taught the scriptures. And every time you speak the word of God to somebody, you are doing exactly as Ezra did. You will be learned in the matters of the Lord and you teach it. You teach it. God wants us to do that. And I hope you are. So that's who he was. An Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest. Look what he said. This letter goes to Ezra the priest, teacher of the law of the God of heaven. Wow, I love that. So look at number two on letter B. Not only was he a priest in number one, number two, he was a what? Scribe. A scribe. Because he could not perform his functions as a high priest, he gave his time to the study of what? The law of God or the law of the word of God. The law of God according to verses 10 and 12. 10 and 12 says he was a what? Teacher. teacher. I got to tell you about my little boy I'm teaching. I'm teaching a little boy in first grade reading. So cute. And um, we're reading a book about Lad. Lad was the name. And I said, now what is a lad? And of course he didn't know. And I said, well, it's a boy. And girls are lassies. Well, that didn't fit right in his opinion either. But he, whatever I say must be right because I'm the teacher. And I said, so your teacher is going to say someday, okay, lads and lassies. So he got the word lad. And then this lad, lad, had a fat, fat cat. This fat, fat cat sat in the box. It sat and sat in the box, this fat, fat cat did. He was loving this. How could you love some kind of reading like that? But he was. And lad sat also. He sat and sat. He took a nap. And he sat. In fact, he sat on a, and there was a brand new word for my little boy, K-E-G, keg. And he read it. Usually he guesses, okay? But he knew he better not guess in front of Miss Wilcoxon. So he sounded it out and it said keg. He said, I almost said barrel because we see lads sitting on a barrel. But it said keg, okay? So the very last of the story is Fat Fat Cat is in a box with six kittens. So he figured out that he, the cat, had six kittens. And that must have been a lot of eggs. <laughs> Isn't that great? So we were trying to tell him, you know, it's not a he. <laughs> and it's not eggs. We didn't even tell, well, you know, that's not my job. I just said, <laughs> it's so funny funny. They make me laugh. When I used to teach school, I just laugh every day. I always look for something really precious and funny. So, what did I have to... Oh! Then I found you, honey. You're precious and funny. I can say something. You know, you don't want to say anything, Timothy. But, and now God has called me to be a teacher, not only of reading, but of the law of God, of the Word of God. Isn't that exciting? So this 
this scribe was a teacher of the law. And Timothy, you asked me why Artaxerxes, because I think Ezra told him, of course, Ezra told him about the God of heaven, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews, and, and about his laws. And, and Artaxerxes knew the history of Israel. How did he know that? Because Ezra taught him. And eventually Nehemiah is going to teach him. So he was a teacher and well versed in the law of God. He devoted himself to what? Study. To the study uh, and commandments. Observation. Observa oh, an ob observing of the law of the Lord and to following its decrees. Or whatever. Whatever it says up there. All right. So now let's look at some other things we know about Ezra. He was a prophet. Now the scriptures don't tell us this. We get this from Jewish tradition. So look on page 124. He was a prophet. And we know that a prophet is one who speaks for God to the people. In contrast, when he functioned as a priest when he got to Jerusalem, the priest speaks for the people to God. So we see Ezra as both a priest and a prophet, don't we? Because here he is speaking and writing the word of the Lord to the people. A prophet speaks to the people for God. A priest speaks to God for the people. I taught you that before, haven't I? And so we know that Ezra was a prophet because we know he wrote the book of Ezra, for one thing, the word of God. Jewish tradition, this is so neat, tells us that Ezra wrote 1st and 2nd Samuel. In fact, Jewish tradition says they didn't even have these books or there were, these books didn't exist until Ezra. Uh, and because, so he wrote this oral history that came down through the, through the generations, and he's the one who put it in writing, the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. We know that in the, book, in the land of Babylon, they had the first five books of the law. We know that. And they had Joshua. So we don't, what we don't know, we know they didn't have the other books. So Ezra wrote for the people the history of the Jews, beginning in 1st and 2nd Samuel. He wrote a history of the kings of the United Kingdom and of the divided kingdom. He wrote 1st and 2nd Kings. It's a good thing, isn't it? And he also wrote 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Now, if you remember, First and sec the Second Chronicles, the very last verses, Cyrus says to the people, those who want to may go up to Jerusalem. Remember, that's the last verse in Second Chronicles. You turn the page and, you turn, and you're looking at Ezra. So you want to do that in your Bibles? Go to the last verse of Second Chronicles, right before Ezra. And I will read to you this, verse 23. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven. You notice that the Persians call the God of Israel the God of heaven. Has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Cyrus says this. Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. In the Hebrew Bible, that is the last verse. So get your Hebrew Bible at home and look it up. You'll find that's the last verse. But for you and I, we just turn the page. Turn one page. And what book are you looking at now? Ezra. Ezra. Look at the first verse. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord, Cyrus of Persia made a proclamation and put it in writing. And there are the very same words. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build a temple for him in, at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. The very same words. So we assume then that Ezra wrote First and Second Chronicles, and then he writes the post-exilic book of Ezra. 
These are all pre-exile. And then he wrote Ezra. All right? And he copied all of the scriptures. All of the scriptures that, that they had brought up from Jerusalem. They had Jeremiah, because, or at least Jeremiah's letters. And um, he copied all of them into Hebrew. And he determined the canon of the Bible, of the Old Testament. What's the canon? When we have, say the word canon of the Bible, the canon of Scripture, what? Agreed upon scriptures. What now? The agreed upon scriptures. That's right. The agreed upon books of the Bible. It was Ezra, according to tradition, who determined the Old Testament canon, the canon of Scripture for the Jews. And furthermore, he took, um, yeah, he, uh, there was another one he did. Oh, he organized the Psalms. Do I have that up there somewhere? He's the one who organized the Psalms because they had them there. And uh, they even had Psalm 137 was the Song of Babylon. Remember that one by the rivers of Babylon. He took all of these Psalms and put them in their order. He is second according to the Jews only to Moses in his role as a prophet. Look how we have neglected so great a man as Ezra, who was the one who copied the scriptures for the Jews so that they would have the word of God and organized it for them. Okay, so that's number uh, three. Do we have any, any questions there? You all are good. Anybody want me to fill any of them in? Tanja? Amy? You got them all? Brenda? <laughs> all righty. Okay. Now, he was a great leader as well. This is letter four. He was a great leader. We know, according to the Jewish tradition, and I don't know why we would even question the Jewish tradition, it was Ezra who established the synagogues. Uh, the people of Israel were scattered all over the world, weren't they? All over the known world it, during the time of the Persian Empire and still today. So it was Ezra who helped establish the synagogues throughout... Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Uh Thank you. I'm, I can do it if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Hurry, boys, hurry. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Oh, I've got to tell you. Last week when I took the crayons and glue and, and scissors back to Tim, he said, how did it go in your adult class? I said, it was fine, except for the one kid who glued his lips together, thinking it was chapstick. That's Kirk. <laughs> And the lady who couldn't get, who, whose glue wouldn't work until someone told her to take the cap off of it. <laughs> That's Brenda. <laughs> she couldn't get her glue to work. <laughs> Where was I? Oh, the synagogues. I am so glad to see you today, Cheryl. We haven't seen you. It's so good to see you. Whenever you miss, I miss you bad. I know, you just missed last week, I know. I Martha's back. He launched the synagogues. He founded the order of the scribes. When you read in the Bible in the New Testament, you're always reading about the scribes and Pharisees, aren't you? Yes, the scribes and the Pharisees in the New Testament. And you think, well, where did the scribes come from? We never read about them in the Old Testament. Well, it was Ezra who founded the order of of the scribes. It was their job to study the scriptures, teach the scriptures, and copy them. That's what the scribes did. And he founded that order. That should be capitalized, probably. And finally, letter C. I love this one, and I didn't know this. Uh, when, we, when we, if you follow the Messianic Jewish work, you'll find that every day there is a scripture to read from the Hebrew Bible from the Old Testament. And it's the same schedule that they have followed now for 2,500 years. The scripture that they're reading today is the same scripture that they read on this day of the year. They've been doing it for 2,500 years. 
and it was Ezra who determined that schedule for them. He wrote the reading schedule that Jews follow today for 2,500 years. So that's number four. How many of you knew that about Ezra? How many of you are sorry we didn't know more about Ezra? Need to teach our children about Ezra. He's one of our great heroes of the Old Testament. So now let's look at Psalm 119. Now, if you don't have your Bible, I want you to I want you to open your Bible to Psalm 119. It is said that he wrote this psalm. Now, when you understand who Ezra is, you will understand why Jewish tradition is that he wrote this psalm. Because it is the longest psalm in the world. We love you, Monica. Thank you for bringing your sweet husband every day. So turn to Psalm 119. This is the longest psalm in the world. I mean in the Bible. <laughs> uh, look, at pay, look at the last verse. How many verses are in this psalm? 176 psalms. Verses. She. 176 verses. And when you read it, you will find that every verse mentions the Word of God. Isn't that great? Every verse refers to the Word of God. Now listen, Ezra loved the Word of God. He was a student of the Word. He taught it every day. It was his life. It was his life's blood. And then you read Psalm 119 and you can say, it was only Ezra who could have written this because it's everything about the Word of God. It's his testimony and it is his instruction to the Jews about God's Word or his teachings to the Word. So number five, Jewish tradition is that Ezra wrote Psalm what? The longest chapter in the Bible. How many verses? 176. 176 verses. After reading it, we understand why people say that it was uh, Ezra who wrote this psalm. It is his testimony. It is his instruction or his teaching to the exiles as they lived in, Jerus in the Babylon and as they lived in Jerusalem. He mentions God in every verse, 176 times. So let's just look at a few verses. Do you just go through it and just look at every verse you can find real quickly and see how he mentions God. Number 105, look at that. Verse 105. This is pastors, one of fast pastors' favorite verses. I remember when we first came here, he had a lamp and a flashlight. And he used this. Your word is a lamp to my feet. A lamp only lightens, if you carry it, it only lightens where your feet are, doesn't it? Because it's right here. But then it's, so it's a lamp for your feet, but it's a flashlight for my path. And it goes way out there so you can see the path. That's what God's word is. Amy, as you get older and as you make more decisions and as you become such a great young woman, use God's word as a, a lamp for your feet. What, where you put your steps, you ought to know exactly every day where you're putting your steps. God's word will tell you where to put your steps. And then it will give you a light to your path. Now, many, many times that path has a real sharp corner, doesn't it? You can't see past that corner. But stay on the path. God's word will give you a light. Isn't that exciting? And we need to remember that this is what Ezra told us. And he said, um, let's see. So he said, look in verse 129. Your statutes, that's your law. That's what a statute is. When I worked in the legislature and when I was in the Senate, and they'd talk about the statues, <laughs> the Oklahoma statues. No, it just hurt my ears so bad. It's the Oklahoma statutes. has that T in there. Uh, your statutes, your laws are wonderful. Therefore, I do what? Okay. I obey them. You see how he's just 
just elevates and exalts the word of God. So he talks about God 176 times in every verse. He mentions God's word 178 times. I didn't go back and count. But you can see, I don't know what two verses mentioned him, his word twice. But um, look at verse 1 through 8. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Real quickly, and I want you to see how many different words he uses for scriptures. You ready? And we're going to write them down as we go. Num letter B, how many words does he use for scriptures? I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Here we go, quickly. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to what? The law. The law. So he calls it the law of the Lord. Verse 2, blessed are they who keep his what? statutes, verse 2, and seek him with all their heart. You see, Amy, that's what we do with God. We keep his statutes and we seek him with everything we have. Letter, th verse 3, they do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. What's there? The word of God is his ways. Verse 4, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Precepts are his laws. Verse 5. Oh, that my, way, my ways were steadfast in obeying your <coughs> decrees. Got it? Are you following with me? Am I giving you the answers or are you looking in your Bible? Didn't get an answer here. <laughs> Thank you, Dursella. <laughs> Verse 6. I would not be put to shame when I consider all of your what? Yeah. Commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. That's wonderful, isn't it? Every verse is like that. I hope you study that chapter this week and think about Ezra. Leah. When you read the Bible this week and you read this, think about that God's word is a light for you. It will help you make the right decisions on everything you do. Wasn't that great? And God says when you do that, you will succeed. That's wonderful. So, letter C. He makes 70 prayer requests in these, in these words. 70 prayer requests. He mentions suffering 66 times. And then my question to you is, what verses do you know from Psalm 119? You know that one. I want you to learn a few more. And what verses have you marked? I've marked a whole bunch of them up. I hope you will. Let's pray, because people want in here. Father, we thank you for this man, Ezra. We thank you, Lord, that he loved your word. He was a student of your word. He, wa he obeyed your word. And he gave us these verses right here that we are to understand that we are to follow you, to follow your commands, your statutes, your word, your decrees, and that your word is a light for us. It's a lamp to our feet and a flashlight to our path. And we can count on that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you for a man like this. And may we model our lives after him. And we give you all of the glory and all of the praise. And it's in Jesus' name, our Savior, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher. Martha?